Um, yeah, the last week. I'm I'm basically going to end up talking about water for, you know, 45 minutes and then, then probably have a stroke. So welcome to episode 5 of the OSINT Bunker podcast in collaboration with the UK Defence Journal. Let's just hop into it real quick today because I am tired and the last 48 hours, actually 72 hours have been fairly exhausting um, news-wise. I, I know uh, someone hasn't been keeping up with the news because, you know, of course he hasn't. But um, yeah, Ukraine. Let's let's just get started on that. So um, we have the European Union coming in fairly hot today saying that Russia has massed over 150,000 troops um, on the uh, general border area with Ukraine and uh, Crimea as a whole. So that was definitely interesting to see because I don't think we even thought that was the number um, that that we even expected. Uh, just just from what from the traffic we had saw on the railways and you know road based traffic, I, I I don't think we even thought it could be that much. I mean that's like half of Russia's ground forces in in regular service. I mean. Uh, obviously something something isn't jiving here something isn't matching up and i've just i'm sort of confused either how we missed that massive of a build up or you know maybe someone else is wrong that's more or less two times the british army at at at, at the border with ukraine i mean what is it jordan i mean what have we got now was it um 75000 Probably that, but bearing in mind, not all of them will be active com active combat. A lot of them will be in like the such a, yeah yeah rules such as logistics, which is one of the bigger takes up a larger amount of them. So if you actually look at actual combat troops, it's way 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 just more. Yeah yeah, yeah well that, yeah that's that's a different conversation, isn't it altogether? I mean, which it's... one where we can scream and shout? <laughs> you know, well, I, I mean, it, at some point the the cost of keeping that many troops near the border is just astronomical per se. I mean, you've got nearly, you know, you've got 150,000 troops. You're obviously having to, you know, keep them fed, import water. Obviously that's a big one because there's no water in Crimea right now. I mean, the main reservoir is, is, or most of the reservoirs as, as I saw in the Sentinel data today, and I'd, I'd put out a tweet about that. Um, are at under 15% capacity from normal. They're 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 basically empty. Um, so they're having to supply these soldiers with pretty much their own supplies from you know remote locations, and and obviously that comes with some large expenses. It's not like they intend to permanently base these soldiers there. So they must be intending to use them in some way, shape, or form, whether that is, you know, trying to intimidate the Ukrainians or actually attempting to use them for offensive purposes. So I, I, I think we definitely, at this point, I'm leaning towards thinking that it's going to be offensive. Just, I I looked at the past few weeks and, you know, I was, on the past couple of podcasts, I was saying perhaps it's more political maneuvering. You know, they're they're trying to scare the Ukrainians. But at this point, I mean, you sort of have you, to look you at wouldn't it. Ex- you wouldn't expend all that money just for the point of intimidating someone. There's far cheaper ways to do it. Yeah, you 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 can move it. You can move a tenth of the troops and have just as much intimidation factor. You know, you can fly some planes near the border. This, I mean, what we're seeing looks like a legitimate build up to invasion, and I think the Russians are banking on. NATO not stepping in in any way, shape, or form. Um, and w- with the number of troops they, um, you know, they they have massed. I just I, I I'm sort of looking at the map here, but I, they must be intending to move up all the way to the Dnieper River. I mean, I I don't see any other really path there, just with the number of troops that they have. Um, so that's that's it's it's sort of interesting what they what they're probably intending to do. Yeah, um, as you just said, it's even if this was an exercise, the Russians would be spending upwards of you know mil- hundreds of million of you know hardware, transport, logistics. What we've seen so far, it it's be... also the unnecessary disruption. With you saw there were stories at the beginning that farmers couldn't move stuff on rail cars because they were all in use, and it just seems pointless to cause that that disruption to a key element such as food supplies 
if you aren't actually intending to do anything with it. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. And it's yeah, it's it's worrying that it's got to this point that actually there's no other explanation we have that Russia is playing. Yeah, and, and that's that's obviously a, a big thing to um uh, to, to look at at least. I just I I I have to step back and just say, you know, what do the Russians expect to get out of this? Obviously, if they intend to capture territory, they intend to restore water supply to Crimea because have they done a cost benefit analysis and sort of seen, you know, desalination plants and the hard line water supply won't work? Um or or just have they decided that it would be more territorial advent it, it would it would be more advantageous for them to control all the territory up to the Dnieper River you know have full control of the sea of azov you know have have the straits of kerch you know finally under their complete dominion and and not have to sort of work with the ukrainians um on on controlling that and and it just it 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 comes down to this question of one, what are their goals? Two, how much is it, it going to cost? And three, what is it going to take in terms of physical manpower? They obviously have the physical manpower there. Um, I, I think they've calculated in the costs of whatever they intend to do. They maybe haven't assumed the quantity of sanctions they might see, in, you know, see into the future. Um, but the thing that we don't know, and, and obviously we can only make guesses at, is is what are their final goals? You know. Do they intend to steamroll through all the way, you know, across Ukraine? You know, do do they intend to cause enough issues in Ukraine that they can replace it with a puppet state? Just what what is their end goal here? Um, and obviously, you know, NATO and Ukraine is also trying to figure that out right now. Um, Ukraine has obviously made statements over the past, you know, week they seem to be prepared to acquire or correction they seem to be looking into acquiring nuclear materials again as when they gave up their nuclear arsenal right after the cold war they were the third largest nuclear power in the world um in terms of warheads they, they obviously didn't have the greatest deployment methods but just with the breakup of the soviet union they were in that situation and a lot of a lot of former soviet republics found themselves with a lot of nuclear material and basically the u.s decided to spend a lot of money in order to denuclearize because the, these countries so you saw you know uh, we just finished down blending down Kazakhstan's, you know, last high amount of highly enriched uranium. Um, and Ukraine at the time agreed to give up their nuclear weapons in exchange for protection by Europe and the U.S. from potential Russian aggression. At the time, obviously, Russia was definitely on the back foot. We thought they were opening more to the West. They would become this, you know, this new European power, you know, become integrated into the whole European system. And that sort of fell apart with, you know, that idea fell apart with Vladimir Putin. But, um, you know, Ukraine has moved off, or gave up their nuclear weapons off of this, you know, idea that they would not have to deal with Russian aggression. And, you know, because they had this this inherent promise with the West. Um, and, you know, there, there is this there is this historical, um, you know, Russian aggression into Ukraine, obviously, you know, the Holodomer, um which is criminally not talked about um, in school. But this this whole idea that Ukraine would be protected by the West has sort of been shattered, um, or was shattered in 2014, um, with the separatist movement and the Russian backing of that. Um, so Ukraine has looked at that and they've sort of said, well, what if we go back to, you know, having nuclear material? What if we go back to having nuclear weapons? It, it makes us a much harder country to deal with. And it, it, it makes Russia think twice before taking action against us. And, you know, Ukraine is currently paying their former nuclear scientists from the Soviet era not to, you know, build nuclear weapons for other countries and, you know, to keep them sort of under control. They've basically paid them to stay in the nuclear power industry. Um, I'm not under any illusion that they wouldn't be prepared to, you know, restart nuclear production and and i feel like that might be a um that that might be a significant possibility heading into the future especially if russia carries through with offensive actions yeah and we had this chat the other day didn't we on twitter about how ukraine is ironically one of the three main officially non-nuclear states that would have the least resistance or trouble in actually acquiring a nuclear 
type weapon. Oh, you know, oh. through the expertise they've still yeah. got, and you know, actually, material they've still got. All they have to really do is put two and two together. Oh, ab- absolutely, beyond beyond absolutely. Um, uh, they 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 have the capability. They have the scientists. They have the facilities. They have they have everything. Right now, they are you know for at least for the last. 25 27 years they have been a nuclear capable power without actually acquiring nuclear weapons so that that was a big thing for them um you know they they had all this capability but they were under the protection of the west they they you know they voluntarily gave up their weapons it was one of these big you know wins for globalism and nuclear nonproliferation and it was under this, you know, implied agreement that we would protect them, that, you know, the West would keep them safe. Um, you know, that that sort of fell apart. And that is, you know, one of the consequences of, you know, not keeping up with your promises, you know. Yeah. Um, he, yeah. And I think that's quite worrying, isn't it? The, that, the fact that Ukraine has just openly come out and said that we will have no hesitation in acquiring nuclear weapons. It's a bit. It's a bit of a breather, you know, because obviously that that indicates they believe they are under a good amount of threat. Yeah, well, if you had one hundred and fifty thousand troops on your borders, you would definitely think so. I mean, yeah, yeah, completely. Their one saving grace think... right now, for at least that position, is they don't think moving into the future that Russia, or at least the near future, that Russia will attempt to take, you know, a significant amount of territory. There, Russia will perform some sort of limited invasion at worst um so it it gives them time to operate you know but if they decide to go forward with that what's the plan yeah um and i think everyone knows at this point that it will get very messy should that occur um and it's quite you you need a bit really does relate to the fact that ukraine in, in its governmental capacity is crying for support at the moment, I think what they're trying to do with that is say that if no one else will support us, then we'll have to, we'll have no choice but to X. Um, and you know, NATO, United Nations, European Union have done nothing so far apart from issue statements of condemnation, statements of concern, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And, and Ukraine is obviously taking the, the approach that that simply isn't good enough. Yeah, and I I should have said that earlier is that. This is mainly a political maneuver right now. It is, you know, it is a threat to NATO and the U.S. of, you know, you had this massive progress and we are willing to undo it because you guys didn't hold up to your side of the bargain. You know, we need you guys to hold up to your side of the bargain here. Yeah, that's completely true. And I mean, Jordan will, you know, form us more in a minute, but NATO has been more than happy to deploy a number of I-Star assets off the coast of Crimea, but they've not. They've not really it's, had. It's 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 de- it's daily missions now. There's always a, an RAF rivet joint goes up in the morning to monitor Crimea back by the evening, and probably for, and usually from about midday onwards, the U the US either sends up a P eight or what's now arrived is an EP three. Yeah, the EP three yeah, is um, more of a uh, of a um, signals intelligence platform, while the P8 is more of, you know, uh, uh, physical intel, you know, um, and, and surface search radar. Um, it's it's more towards that. And um, obviously we've had the Global Hawk that's, that does, that daily. often does regula- regularly go, that would regularly go over Eastern Ukraine sort of before this, before the latest build-up in Crimea, but it's, it's remained focused on Eastern Ukraine instead of going up to the Baltics, what it, it used to do. It, yeah, the the intensity of the flights as well. I think we're now seeing, um, we've seen two individual, two two distinct hex coded um, uh, on ADSB um, RQ fours. So global hawks. So so we believe it's it's at least two different global hawks providing a near continuous coverage at this point, most likely. Um, combined with, of course, the other assets, which means there's there's most likely never, you know. A, a time where there isn't an ISR platform up in the area, um, which which again allows you know commanders and and politicians to get an accurate view of what the Russian buildup looks like, and that's probably where they're getting the hundred and fifty thousand number from. Um, mm-hmm. 
but it's 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 just the intensity at this point of those ISR flights is is fairly incredible. Um, something that I don't think we've ever actually seen before. It probably hasn't been this intense. I don't know if it was this intense back in 2014, but to be honest, in 2014, I was, I was, I was literally this. Most, I never paid any att- attention to understand what was going on back in 2014, so can't really compare it. Anyone can by this point. It, this is, I would say, unprecedented because Crimea was always disputed. Um, and we're at the point now where Ukraine as a sovereign nation is not disputed and we're looking at a risk of a mainland invasion uh, and that you know that's many people are comparing it to Crimea yet yeah, fine you know that that's it's a good comparison but at the end of the day Crimea was disputed and the sovereign nation of Ukraine is a solid foundation of which if invaded then all hell breaks loose and and I think one of the issues as well is that initially, I think a few weeks ago, obviously when I created my big thread on the water crisis in Crimea, you know, most of us thought, you know, the absolute worst case scenario was Russia would do a limited offensive into Ukraine to attempt to restore, you know, water access to Crimea and and maybe secure the positions of the Russian separatists. Now we're seeing this this more looming threat of a a wider scale offensive into Ukraine that would, you know, target Mariupol and, you know, other cities, like actual large cities in order to, to capture and secure large amounts of territory. And that definitely changes the situation. I think a lot at the end of the day, um, you're, you're looking at the, at a situation which could rapidly, you know, spiral out of control, obviously, because at some point NATO will have to step in. NATO cannot allow a significant portion of Ukraine to fall to Russia. They, they just can't at this point. Um, and so they'll obviously start to take actions, probably first with material aid. They already said they would do that in case of, you know, invasion by Russia. But, you know, at, at what point, if the Ukrainians are losing uh, and losing significantly, does NATO decide to step in with hard force? You know, I, where that line is, I obviously have no idea what NATO intends to do. You know, but but at some point they have to. Yeah, and correct me if you know, it's probably a controversial thing. Many people listening might not agree with this, but I'm not sure NATO knows where the red line is. Um, I'm not I'm not entirely sure that I I, I wouldn't where... disagree with you at all on that one. Yeah, I'm not sure even NATO that, knows what the red line is. That's completely accurate. I I, I yeah. don't. Yeah, it's it, it's rough there. Um, and and I don't I don't think they really have um. A comprehensive idea probably of what russia is even trying to do at this point yeah and that's you know that's what russia has done very well is keep everyone second guessing either it's net it's not an exercise it is an exercise what they you know what they're hiding they're doing it very well um you know operational uh, operational security as we know is compromised you know social media snap maps tiktok it, it's it's always Facebook. been trash to be honest. Yeah, Russian OPSEC is, is absolute shite, as we know. Um, yeah. That, that is their that is their Achilles heel. Forget forget armor plating on T-90s. Forget, you know, you know all this reliability on tanks, armored vehicles. You, you've, got, you've got a geezer on a railway platform with his phone. That is the chink in the armor. Yeah, and of course, with OSINT tools, you're able to then geolocate it and start tracking it. And we obviously have a channel on our server just dedicated to tracking movements. And I go through that, you know, every few days and I just fill in the spreadsheet of, you know, where stuff was spotted, how much, you know, from where, what type, um, quantity. And it's really easy to start tracking, you know, these movements. Granted, though, from what we've seen and from what I, I've I've looked at, you know, the numbers of 150,000 and the actual equipment we're seeing sort of isn't lining up, probably somewhere around a factor of 10. So some somewhere the Russians have actually managed to sneak in some extra equipment. Um, at this point, though, you know, we're, we're sort of looking and try to figure out, you know, obviously Russian intentions. I think a big indicator will be whether or not... Um, Ukraine decides to call up their reserves um, and order general mobilization, because for Ukraine, that's a super expensive thing to do, and they won't do that until they're sure enough that Russia's going to try something. Um, and they, 
you obviously at this point you're you're not going to take Ukraine by surprise by surprise. There's enough you know U.S. U.K. Um, general NATO assets in the area that'll be able to monitor the situation. And any Russian, you know, build up very close to the border in staging areas will be found fairly quickly, um, which which will give Ukraine some time. But when Ukraine decides to do that call up, y- you can basically be sure that something is imminent. The moment they do that, that is really all hands on deck. They would have actionable intelligence suggests that you know they would be looking at an invasion, and it's it's ground zero, I think, from there. Um, I think the situation, as we discussed a couple of weeks ago, is still not being covered well at all. Um, still not getting hardly any coverage. Um, you know, it, so it's, it, it's, it's not good enough. At least in the U.S. is starting yeah, to get yeah, no, more attention. I acknowledge it's getting some. But one of the issues is that it keeps getting politicized so quickly. Like, people start, you know, saying, oh, Biden's a war hawk and, you know, he's going to take us to war again with Russia. I'm like, what? It, how is the the if anything nato and the us are being super careful here they're 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 doing almost nothing and and it just it gets politicized so quickly and people refuse to look at you know russia is amassing troops on the border like they they are prepared to invade like it just i i almost think a lot of the discussion and a lot of the blaming is coming from you know artificial sources obviously we have seen the russians really really like disinformation campaigns especially on the internet they they love that um and and so you might see that moving into the future that they you know try to make it a political issue inside the US um and and i mean they they've done that with so many issues in the past but i think They've sort of been leading up to something like this, where it wasn't as common in 2014. You didn't see as much, you know, Russian disinformation spreading about the initial invasion. There was more, you know, uh, an actual productive talk about it. Um, But now you're seeing more, you know, everything gets politicized immediately, Um, which which obviously causes issues even when you're trying to report on it. Yeah, um, yeah, that's a very point isn't it that the russians almost have a signature and that is disinformation um that area that area of the world seems to be quite good at it um quite fond of it and as you know as we're seeing at the moment it's something in which russia isn't afraid to use um and you're right about the politicization of it. it um i'm sick and tired of seeing it personally it's you know identity politics should come I'm way down the list when we're looking at an invasion of a sovereign country. You know, yeah, this... I don't care whether you're left or right. Just shut up. Deal with the situation at hand. I mean, this is this is an issue we should be fairly united on. I mean, this is obviously in Europe for you guys. It, it's a bit more important because you're just a tiny bit closer. Um, but but America has has forged deep ties with these nations, and, and you know it, it's not like they're an extension of America per se, because that's obviously stepping a lot of boundaries on on sovereignty. But you know it's it's sort of this sphere of common nations, you know, where they may have disagreements on some issues, but there's this general idea of you know how they should operate and what they should do, and you know if there's an issue taking criticism from the other nations internalizing them and trying to you know make a change and you know that was that was that that's basically been the general idea um since you know right after world war ii um and russia really isn't part of that per se and not even per se at all um where they just have such a different modus operandi you know when it comes to international politics and they 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 just operate so differently I think that's what that's what you know done them so well is that they used to follow their adversaries. Yeah, I mean it's, it, it's... it. It comes down to you know I'm going to lapse into you know being a poli sci major again, but you know it's it's the the realist versus you know the the liberal perspective you know in in international politics where um you know the Russians obviously believe that you know everyone is out to get them therefore they need to be out to get everyone where you know everyone acts in their own self-interest versus you know the sort of at least it's a combination of liberalism and constructivism um 
where um, these, you know, European nations and America at least believes that, you know, countries relate to each other by either, you know, how they've interacted with each other in the past or, you know, by institutions and by, you know, by proactive democratic principles. Um, whereas there are some other nations who, you know, believe that everyone acts in their own self-interest, which definitely at least with how globalized we are, you know, in the past 50, 60 years, causes issues. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's a good way of putting it, I think. Yeah, that's, you know, party politics coming again when you're discussing individual nations responding in terms of foreign policy. Um, yeah, well, we're, we're know, obviously US... not talking about party politics in Russia, are we? No, definitely not. <laughs> um yeah, that's that's a very important thing. Again, might sound boring in terms of what we're talking about, but politics is that you know it with the entire thing here revolves around people's ideologies, and some of the most important of these is you know in Europe, the European Union, NATO, the leaders of those countries have a very vocal role to play in terms of their response. Countries like Germany, France um, are hell-bent on appeasement i'm not a fan of as 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 is by this point i'm not a fan of how they operate um mainland european foreign policy i i don't agree with you know about i'd say 75 percent of the time and i think it's very outdated um as as it is now you know all we've seen from france and germany is we're concerned you know yeah that's great so what are you going to do about it and then follow up that question guess what the answer is we don't know yeah i mean france is getting a bit better um they they went through a period they france is dealing with a combination of internal issues right now which definitely puts them in a vulnerable position at least when trying to operate outside their own borders it, it's more the difference between these democratic nations and russia russia you know i mean they they claim to be a multi-party state it's a uniparty state it, it is russia is putin um, Putin, of course, has some people he has to please and, and some people he, you know, has to make happy. He has to keep his keys to power happy. But but generally, you know, Russia revolves around Putin, whereas in these, you know, Western European countries, you know, Macron is trying to balance multiple factions. He's trying to balance, you know, the will of the electorate, um, all these people together and, and then try to project some sort of foreign policy. Um, and the U.S. too has had that issue where, you know, we've seen just tectonic shifts between Obama to Trump to Biden in what the, you know, modus operandi of a foreign policy is. And and so Russia is able to more or less put together these long term consistent plans where these, you know, Western nations sort of have to, you know, move quickly and change their general positions quickly based on what the electorate feels like um y you know which which obviously can cause issues as we you know as we've seen in the u.s um trump trump's foreign policy was was strong you know, that there is it's very cliche you know very cliche thing to say but it was very strong um in comparison to the current administration more or less eclipsed it in terms of what kind of action we saw against factions um yeah I, and i think i don't think i i really honestly would... i don't know what the best word is to describe the the trump administration foreign policy i would unfocused maybe would be a good word um you didn't really know who was in charge day to day. There was obviously some major competition. That wasn't between... just foreign policy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh. foreign policy was definitely a big element of it. But you know, you saw these these warring factions inside the White House of obviously John Bolton, who wanted to start you know a new war every Tuesday, um, and and you know yeah. other other dovish you know people inside the White House. Kushner, um, definitely being one of them. Um, you know, I, I know people love to insult him, but I, I, I don't know how he was successful. He, he seems to be a man that somehow blunders into success. Um, don't, don't really know how, just know he managed to pull it off. 
Um, yeah. But you you saw these sort of you saw these factions warring inside the White House, and and it was whoever could you know grabs Trump here that week, um, and so we we definitely we we saw you know that ping ponging back and forth, which it definitely served. Um, I the the one thing that other countries could repl- could you know at least rely on the U.S. to be foreign policy wise during that period was you know unpredictable. Um, which you know, in such, and of itself, such a fun time. Yeah, it was four years of just hanging on, waiting for the next crisis to happen. <laughs> oh, it was, it was it was four years of chaos, you know. Um, oh yeah, and and with the Biden administration, it's not that you know what they're going to do, but you have a general idea. Um, yeah, although in that case, in this case, it's appeasement, um, negotiations, concern. Yeah, Biden has definitely been more focused on domestic issues. Um, yeah, without a doubt. Without, I mean, we've seen that from day one, haven't we? Really? Yeah his his entire platform seems to be more generally running on, you know, domestic issues, bringing troops home from Afghanistan. Um, you know, uh, if, if we're dealing with other countries internationally, it's probably just going to be on climate issues. Um, trade really has not been something they focused on at all um obviously the the whole uh refugee number um debacle that happened last friday inside the administration was definitely i think a telltale sign of what was happening um yeah and and you know seeing that and and i i think they're trying to balance this idea of working inside the u.s and staying you know more inward focusing at least right now with the the frankly series of foreign actions happening um you know in iraq obviously what have there been 23 individual rocket attacks on u.s coalition and u.s contractor activities inside of you know inside of Iraq um, it, since he came into office three months ago. So that's that's been a huge element. Um, and then, of course, um, obviously the Russian actions and then trying to deal with Iran and the current Israeli, you know, Iranian back and forth over cargo ships and tankers. Um, yeah. And that's important to note, isn't it? It's not like that stuff's gone away either. Yeah. I, I will say the Trump administration definitely was luckier in their first few months um, in that they they really had nothing too serious to deal with. There, there was obviously the Russian election stuff, but that wasn't exactly a difficult issue to navigate internationally. It, it, it was sort of a minefield domestically, obviously, but 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 there really were the, the stakes were fairly low on the international scene, um, whereas now you have these larger issues. I'm going to talk about water now, because because water seems to be everything. Honestly, at this point, um, I I had posted a tweet earlier uh, today or yesterday when this eventually airs, um, specifically talking about the water situation in um, Crimea, and I'll I'll throw some pictures up uh, for for everyone to see and some some back and forth imagery. But I mean, the situation is dire. Obviously, we're we're seeing water supplies under you know, um, 10%, um, in, in most major reservoirs in, in, in Crimea, um, we're, and, and, and it's, it's the wet season right now. It's, it's the end of the wet season. These, these reservoirs should be nearly full. We're, we're going to be moving into the summer soon. And it, it really doesn't rain in Crimea during the summer. Um, and, and most of the rain they get is during these winter months and you don't have the Crimean canal growing season. It's planting season right now. It's going to be growing season soon. They're going to need water supplies for that. Um, so we're probably going to see at least a near collapse of agriculture on, you know, in Crimea. Um, so just moving forward, I, I don't... The, the Russians are obviously in this crunch where they have, you know, a few weeks probably to resolve this issue. Maybe maybe a month or two. Um, b- before it becomes critical and they, they start having to truck water over to people, um, which which is insanely expensive and, and just not really feasible. A canal is not an expensive endeavor. Um, 
a war though is an expensive endeavor and i think they're basically at this point they've they've probably taken a cost benefit analysis and seen this this catastrophic water situation in crimea has to be resolved as as soon as possible and um honestly uh utilizing sentinel data um imagery is is one of the best things you can do to to look at this and to you know see what's going on that's obviously a, a very big part of this um using these these OSINT techniques um to to you know effectively find things that you otherwise wouldn't be able to i know the russians haven't exactly been open about the water crisis um there's been some independent reporting inside of the crimean peninsula that sort of talking talked about it um but but other than that you you haven't seen much so you have to use these you know aerial and and space based photos and you know reservoirs are a super easy thing to look at um it's you know one of those easier uh techniques it's more or less just a photo isn't it yeah it it's it's, it's just it, a big it's, picture it's by the eye it's a good old good old eyeball method well it's 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 more an issue of you know you can see clear changes um that's that's definitely one of the easiest things. It's a really big object and it's changing. Um and you can use the the cheap free low resolution imagery to actually see the changes. Um which is the big thing. You you aren't relying on on that high resolution imagery. Yeah, and that's it's reliable, isn't it? And I don't think there's any way to deny that should something be drained or or withheld then there would be tangible evidence to suggest that is happening. Yeah, um, I I know people yet. people were trashing me on my uh, thread, you know, a few weeks ago about the water crisis, saying, "Oh, there's there's no water crisis in Crimea. Russia will just, you know, build a pipeline, or or you know, they'll they'll build desalination plants." Well, well, no, <laughs> they they haven't done that yet because it's really freaking expensive, um, and and so you're and at you're the end looking, of the day, yeah, Russia isn't the most wealthy of nations is it i mean no no they honest. they got wrecked by sanctions in 2014 and 2015 that was that was not a fun time for the russian economy just look look at it look at a price chart on the ruble i'll i'll throw it up here it crashed i mean it it became legitimately far more expensive to live in russia just because of the absolute collapse in the ruble and so you know i know people are saying you know sanctions won't do much against russia yeah, sanctions will do a lot against Russia. Sanctions are potentially disastrous. There, I think there's a chance that Russia has been, I guess, preparing for sanctions, trying to diversify um, their export capabilities. Um, I'd be I'd be shocked if they weren't. Yeah. Again, the peep, the other parties that they export to. I mean, it's not like North Korea is paying them for the oil. Um, Iran has their own oil, uh, and and they're the, you know China has been in an, has been in sort of a tiff with Russia since the 1970s. So they 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 have this strained relationship. It's it's on and off. It's it's very a, a confusing relationship, and you have to go into a lot of history over it. Um, but basically, you're just looking at this, and sanctions can affect Russia very very deeply. Um. And I think if the Russian people start seeing, you know, prices go up, you know, very quickly again with high inflation and, you know, if if they see, you know, regular luxuries be be um, blocked and, and their quality of life goes down, you know, they're going to get angry at Putin again. You know, Crimea, the first war in Crimea worked because they took it effectively overnight. Um they never directly had Russian soldiers inside, you know, Ukraine in, in the disputed areas, at least, at least officially. Um, yeah, little green men, all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah. But that, got that's, lost. that's deniable, really easy to work on. Um, but with, with an offensive like that, that's a different story. You're going to have Russians coming home in body bags and in coffins, um, which is going to, you know, it, it's going to make the populace angry. It's going to cost a lot of money. And I mean, let's be honest. This is Eastern Ukraine. There, there isn't much to take. Yeah. They, they, I mean, they're getting some farmland. They're they're getting some farmland and sort of river access to the Dnieper River. Yeah, it's it's more pride, isn't it? I think than actually necessity in yeah. terms of land. 
and and at some point people are only willing to pay so much for pride um and 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 necessity sort of sort of starts to you know become more important and 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 the saving grace for putin was that trump came into office in 2017 and you know lifted some of the sanctions and made it at least better that isn't the case here i mean biden is in office for you know four more years um it it, it's definitely not going to be easy for him in that case um and and there won't be you know the the relief at any point in the near future and there won't really be any allies if russia invades ukraine um i i i don't see really any um i i guess i I just i i don't really see any countries backing russia on this one apart from of course and this is the last thing i wanted to get into belarus um oh which yeah, yeah yeah client state one um it's and basically Russia. It's Russia v 2.0 with with an even yeah. funnier dictator. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I let me let me just put this simply: Belarus has been moving troops near the border. I'm not sure if they're going to start their own little war with Ukraine at the same time that Russia does. Just you know, draw troops off, make it hard for them. You know, harass across the border, maybe make some pushes, take some old territorial, you know, areas. Um but they're they're they they're probably gonna try something just because, you know, obviously Poroshenko is trying to be Putin Jr. Um that's that's definitely something I expect to see. Yeah, and it's it, and it's gonna be mimicking Russia to the fullest extent. That's all it's gonna be. Um and uh, comes back yeah. to that old cliche. He's probably under Russia's orders. Putin's got his under Putin has him under his thumb. Oh, a- a- absolutely. And and I think, obviously, we had talked about this in an earlier episode. One of the elements that we thought um, Russia was working up to in 2014 was making um, Ukraine and Belarus into client states, um, where they were effectively so close in relation to Russia that they were, they were basically part of Russia again. And... Um, I think one of the important things to look at there was that sort of fell apart very quickly um, with the revolution in Ukraine, and that became a very big thorn in Putin's side. His initial plan was, of course, creating you know these states in into a new buffer zone again, into effectively a new Soviet you know influ- sphere of influence in in Europe, um, and and of course this goes back to the whole historical why Russia has tried to take as much territory as possible because they need buffer states, um, and and you just you look at this and that obviously Putin was trying to do that again, um, and, and it, this this sort of fell apart and that obviously made Putin very very angry, which is why he doubled down his efforts in Belarus. That was a big element of the last year. Um, and now that he's got Belarus resituated and, you know, back in his sphere of influence, he's going after, um, he, he's, he's going after Ukraine. There's, yeah. We could go on for four hours, couldn't we? I yeah, mean... we, yeah, I know, I know it's just the two of us right now, but it's just, look, I'll, I'll go back to the, to the Syria, you know, how, how, what I said about the Syria thing was, it, it sort of seems inevitable at this point, doesn't it? Um, I, I really see no path out yeah and let's pray as a closing sort of note let's pray that history fails to repeat itself (laughs) that 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 is that (laughs) you know history is inevitable isn't it yeah that is that's a very good saying that that'll 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 be my closing quote for today so thank you for joining us um sorry for the abbreviated episode today our our lives have been chaos, frankly, all of us. Um, yeah, we've, and we've, we're busy people. <laughs> our our lives are currently reflecting at about the same level, you know, whatever geopolitical situation is going on, um, which is which is why we pray for things to be boring. Um, but yeah, thank thank you everyone for uh, coming out again, and we will hope to see you next week.